Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. And I am super pumped for this conversation today. So let me introduce you to my next guest. She wears all of the hats. She's a mom, wife, TEDx speaker, podcast host, former CEO of a major corporation, and now author. She has smashed all of the glass ceilings by doing things her way and has lived to talk about it. <laughs> she quit her corporate job when she was at the top of her game because she wanted to help others climb the ladder and have a life that is authentic. Her new book, You Do You-ish, is so much fun and so inspirational. And I am so honored to call this woman my friend, mentor, and inspiration. So meet Erin Hatsakostas. Oh, you are so sweet. What an introduction. So good How to be here. How are you? I'm awesome. I am All awesome. Right. It's Friday. You know, the book is almost coming out um, and I get to spend some time with you. Yay. So your mantra is authenticity. You breathe it, you live it, you bleed it, you model it like it is your life. So what does it mean to be authentic? Yeah, so it's so funny. Um, to me, you know, I'll say right, uh, I cut it off at the pass. I'm, I'm not that person that's out there preaching, be yourself. As synonymous as we say that, that it is about authenticity. My passion around authenticity really came, you know, out of the success that I had in my corporate career. And like with anything, I didn't freaking know, I didn't have a name for it. I didn't know what it was until after the fact, you know, this wasn't something, a badge that I sort of wore. I'd heard the word. Um, but, but for me, you know, authenticity and what I talk about in the book, first of all, it's a much more nuanced and powerful concept. And we can talk about that. Um, and it is not something just passive. Authenticity is actually something that you can use as a strategy, as your secret weapon. It's, it's liberating. Sure. Yes. It's very good for you, but it also drives connection and results and success. And that's why I'm excited about the book and the message I gave in the TED talk that's that um, really this isn't, uh, this isn't a permission. This isn't a la ti da. This is actually something that we can do in the workplace. We can do everywhere and we can have great results. So let's back it up then and talk about you were, you worked for Aetna. You were an actuary that failed. <laughs> That was not yep, your, your was in path, <laughs> yeah. but you continue to climb the ranks and you were offered a promotion that you almost turned down. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, my, my career was um, one of those where each move I made, there was a contemplation, there was sort of a micro strategy, but I always in my head, you know, I saw, you know, I talk about, I used to always run this compromise calculation. I saw sort of what I think a lot of people see, and now I'm fighting against that there's this anti-correlation between sort of climbing the ladder and the sacrifice, the compromise yeah. that you have to make, especially as a, as a mother, as a wife. And so, you know, I, I even said in front of an audience once, you know, when asked about that, I said, the day that that tips completely like is the day I'm done, right? Like that was just, uh, a, you know, a fear of mine. And um, yeah, so I was, you know, had been at Aetna for many years, you know, had had found my way into a couple big girl jobs and then actually joined a wholly owned subsidiary that they had acquired. Um, quite frankly, kind of taking a step back on paper. So I went from managing a team of about 40 people to managing no one. But, you know, it was a, there was some strategic reasons why I jumped into this business. And um and one of those was I knew it was a growing industry, but I also knew it was an acquisition. A lot of the leadership was probably going to leave. Like there's only so long that entrepreneurs can stay, you know, from a smaller company and a big company, they get a little sick of it. So I knew there'd be opportunity. And that's what happened. Every time somebody would leave, essentially they'd be like, uh, let's give it to Aaron. And um, <laughs> which was fine until uh, the day on a Friday that I got a call from my boss, who was the COO at the time. And he sort of availed, hey, look, I've decided to leave the company. Um, and I want to know if it's okay if I recommend you as our next, our next CEO, oh, as my successor. And I remember the conversation. I didn't pause all that long, but I remember literally, and now I name it the compromise calculation uh, to make it tangible for people. But I remember thinking, you know, something like this. Well, I, you know, I make a pre pretty decent salary, don't have a ton of stress because I had strategy marketing. I didn't have like the operations. I didn't have the stuff that was breaking, quite frankly, all the time. <laughs> And I thought, 
you know, is it worth the, you know, whatever raise they would give me? And I said, you know, no, thank you. Um, but then as the story goes, you, you know, I, and I didn't tell this part in the TED talk, but, you know, part of the backdrop too is we kind of talked about, and then I said, well, what's plan B? And <laughs> I think it was probably strategic on us, on his part. I don't know if it was, it was a really smart move. So part B or plan B was like this a-hole guy that I couldn't stand, right? <laughs> You know, of course, I'm like, wait, I'd have to report to him, right? And I'd end up doing all the work. Um, but I went and thought about it over the weekend. And, and I remember even talking to people and, you know, it wasn't like everybody's like, go for it. I mean, one of my friends, um, one of my daughter's friend's parents, I remember him saying, oh, yeah, yeah you wouldn't want to do that. You'd have to like give up so much. You know, he just sort of knowing nothing about really the company or the role. Um and like with anything, you talk to a lot of people, but in the end, it's you that needs to make the decision, you that needs to curate, you know, all those voices. And I thought, what am I afraid of? And, you know, I was afraid of that compromise, but I was most afraid of like essentially becoming some of the people I'd seen, right? Like I, you know, and when I say that, it's not just the sacrifice at home, it's the ego, it's the, you know, you start to become, you know, more rigid and, just all of these things, like this club I didn't want to enter into. Um, and then it hit me, which is a really important message for your listeners and one that I pound away in the book a million times. You shouldn't not do something because you hate the way it was done before. You can do it your own way. And so I thought, well, I don't have to, let's get tangible. Like, I didn't want to travel that much. I'm going to be picky about my travel. You know, I will travel, but I'm going to, for example, my head of sales had no problem jumping on a plane. There's plenty of things I defer to him that maybe another CEO would have, you know, been there, but I didn't. Um, so yeah, I decided, I decided to say, to say yes to that job. And then, you know, once I got over that hump and that was sort of my year of experimenting with doing it your own way, um, as I reflect back. Right. And it wasn't too long before I realized, wait, I'm still the same person. Like, I know I got a bigger title, but I, I literally am going into work, talking to the same people, I wasn't necessarily working harder. I was leading more. That's one of the big myths I talk about in the book, right? I, I think I say, you know, um, leading, you know, working harder often means leading worser, um, which is obviously not very English grammatically <laughs> correct, but that's how I speak, right? Um, and then, you know, once I got past that inertia, then I was like, give me the freaking top role. Give me, I'm, I could take on the CEO role. Um, I can do things my own way. And that happened. That happened a year later. Um, yeah, and it's kind of an interesting story. You know, I'll never forget, again, another phone call. This time, it wasn't on a Friday. It was um, when we were on vacation in Florida. And I remember standing, we were, my parents have a place down there. And I was in the bedroom. We were just minutes away from walking out the door for a family trip to the water park. Our favorite thing to do. We love water parks, but, you know, and it's, you really disconnect, right? You're not walking around with your phone. You're in a bathing suit, hopefully seeing nobody you know. <laughs> was getting so excited, you know, take the family. Um, and my boss at the time calls me myself well, and you know that feeling too when you get that call from the, you know your heart sinks like what's you know what's blowing up what are they gonna you know it's it's never to be like oh how's your great vacation and he said to me hey I've been pulled uh to another huge project it was a big acquisition they were working on and you're going to be named as interim CEO but we're going to go out and make sure there's nobody better we're going to shop there or something like that it was I'm sure much more eloquent but in my head I you know I heard this snarky like you know we're going to make sure like there isn't anybody better. And at first I was pissed, but then it kind of hit me. I thought, you know, while they're making their decision, I'm going to make mine. Do I really want this job? And um, I also thought about, I hate normal. Normal is like my kryptonite I, and it's not to be showy. It's not, I don't know what it is. It's literally, I call it kryptonite because I. it's like this force field. Like when somebody tells me to do something a certain way, it's just like, I, I hate it. And I remember thinking, you know, a normal process would be, you know, my resume and 12 interviews and right going based on credentials and experience and, you know, 30 to 60 minute talks. And I thought I, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't win that way. Like I did, you know, I'd never been in a, a, you know, a CEO. I didn't have, you know, I was 42 years old at the time. Like I definitely did not have as much experience as a lot of people, but I thought, but instead, I'm just going to go out and kick so much ass that, you know, in a couple of months, because I knew it would take them a while to go do their little search. Um, <laughs> there's going to be no question because this company was struggling. There was opportunity. 
And that's what I did. I just said, you know what, I'm just going to kind of ignore that um, and go do my own thing. And I also I just have to share this one piece of advice I got from somebody that I think, you know, at least one of your listeners, hopefully this will change your lives. I went out and, and, and said, okay, which a lot of women, we could do that, right? Like we're going to just go kick ass and prove ourselves, mm-hmm. right? But there was one missing piece. I remember going down, uh, I was in the hallway going to grab lunch or something. And I ran into a colleague. She had, you know, definitely been around uh, much longer than me. And, and she's congratulations. I heard, you know, heard the news, your interim. And, and she said, do you want the job? And I said, yeah, I actually, I do. I want to get the CEO position. And she said, tell, you know, your boss you know, that you want the job. And I never would have thought of that. I don't think a lot of us women, right. I would have gone and I would have gone into my one-on-ones and, you know, we did this and we did that. But having the guts to succinctly see my next one-on-one, you know, I said, and I just want to be clear, I want this job, which not only makes the surface level, which is okay. Now she knows I want it, but it demonstrates, which I talk a lot about in the book modeling, right? It demonstrates kind of the guts, the cojones, the, the directness, right? That you're looking for in a CEO. And that was just one of those moments. It's such a small little interaction, such a small moment. But I often wonder if I hadn't run into Chowee in the hall and heard that little bit bit of advice, you know, if I would have gotten it. So I wanted to share that too. I mean, think about that though. If we took that advice as a woman and just declared what we want about the things, I want the, and finish that sentence. It doesn't even have to be the job. It can be, I mean, God, it could be, it could be anything. Yeah. And how life changing that could be. I mean, that you're right. That is like a game changer for someone because just saying, I want the, and how often it's like, all right, that you think about you're in the back end of your head, letting the, the wheels turn and you're not really saying it and you're not saying it to anyone, but when you put it out there, I love that. I'm going to yeah. use that today. You do it. <laughs> Oh, get everything you want. Is it going to be donuts? Is it going to be donuts? I was going to say, I want the coffee right now and I want the donut. <laughs> All right. So let's, um, let's talk about your book. I read it. I read it overnight. I texted you and was like, oh my God, it's so good because it really is. Um, the way you write it, your voice is so authentic. It's fresh. Um, it's, it's really just so good and not for someone just in corporate America, really anyone just being inspired to really just live an authentic life. So what made you want to write this? Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it means, uh, it feels so good that you connected and, um, yeah, it's very snarky humor. I realized, I, I didn't realize how snarky I was till I finally read the thing, you know, front to back. I mean, I've obviously read and reread, you know, word documents for, for 10 months, but yeah, this, you know, this book was on my heart, I would say starting about a year and a half ago, and not just the like, oh, I need to write a book, because I'm, you know, I'm in this new entrepreneurial space. Um, and to be honest, it, it at the time, it was really about the power of authenticity, it's call it, like, not as much the, the strategy of authenticity. And I remember bringing it up probably the end of 2019 with my, my brand builders coach, I know we're both, you know, we're both part of a program together. And, um, God bless her. And she was so right. She's like, that sounds great, Aaron, but Jesus, you, you got too much other things, you know, too many other things going on. Like, you know, kind of slow your roll. And I'm like, I know that's, you know, that's, that's just my personality. <laughs> One year yeah. later, <laughs> the book is in your hands. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm an IGW, as I yeah. say in the book, an instant gratification horse. So like when I have an idea, it's like, boom. And so I sat on it. Um, and then, you know, the pandemic hit. And it, it was like a combination of one, just it felt like a gremlin trying to crawl out. Like I just felt like there was a message that, you know, I, I really wanted to tell. And then, you know, for me personally, I don't, I like, because I'm an instant gratification whore, I don't like long things. Yeah. Writing a book is a long thing. Like no two ways about it. Pandemic is, right, is, right, is a long thing, no two ways about it. And there was something about, the mindset of settling in for, you know what, for the next year, let's call it, I'm not going to be doing the quick hit, quick fix stuff. I will be, I mean, I'll be getting that hit and other things, but you know, (laughs) my book part um, is, is my opportunity to sort of match this tough time we're in in the long period. I know we were, you knew we were going to have to wait with this long project. And what um, I'm sure, you know, so you're a writer. um, I'm, and by the way, 
you know, I was a math major, obviously not a great one because I failed at actuarial, but I was not an English major, right? You know, and so I went through a lot of that, like, I want to write a book, but I'm not a writer. And I now can firmly say I'm a writer um, because I remember writing my book coach about six months ago or so. And I was like, oh my gosh, it just hit me. Writing is just talking on paper, <laughs> you know, which sounds so stupid, but, but, you know, I can talk. Um, and, and I had figured out, right, that I could write authentically, which is essentially talking on paper. Um, yeah, so I, so I started writing probably end of March, early April, so shortly after the kind of our quarantine. And, you know, the power of writing, like I was saying, is you have to slow down and you actually learn as you do it. So, you know, not that the concept was different, but it got so refined. And I think the biggest refinement epiphany really came where I had always, you know, over the last couple of years, I knew authenticity was my jam. I had kind of figured that out when I retired, the badge was slapped on me, but there was something I always wrestled with in my career that I never reconciled. Um, and this is going to sound weird, like, how did you not reconcile? But I would have a lot of moments where I, you know, I worked hard, of course, um, but I always felt like things were a little bit easier for me. You know, I had friends that would be like, oh, I had to cancel my vacation because we had something, you know, big project. Or, you know, I have a friend that's moved, you know, moved her family like three times in five years to get the next level job, right? Um, I had people that traveled more than I did. Um, and so every once in a while, I would kind of feel guilty slash curious. Like, why, why do I keep propelling? And not just me personally, but the results are coming, which is the reason I was propelling. But it's not that hard. And as I was writing the book, um, which first started out more of as like this, this power of authenticity, I started to realize, oh my God, I had actually been using authenticity as my strategy, like as my secret weapon. And I call it like, it was kind of like this subconsciousness. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm going to whip it out today. Um, but I had used that as the thing that you know, if I had to walk into a room and I knew I was the underdog, whether it was I was the only female, I was the youngest one, all of the above, I was always thinking, well, I can't, just like with that, you know, CEO position, I can't compete necessarily on the game they're playing. What if I changed the game? What if I told a story at the beginning of my quarterly business review instead of go right into it? Like, what if I changed the game and, um, got better talent to work for me because I was more approachable because I wore so much shit on my sleeve. When I, you know, told people about crusty yogurt in my hair, like I write about in the book. So that, you know, that was really, I think the thing that um, became the biggest epiphany. And then of course I also, you know, started to put a framework around it so that, you know, so many people think, well, it's great, but how do you teach it? And, um, you know, that's something that was really important to me too. And I think, you know, hopefully the book, um, at least gives the training wheels to get the, get the, the wheels turning. And then, you know, like I talk about, like, get them, get them going, but eventually like not too far after get addicted to it, have a success and then forget all about the book and do it your own way. And you share what, what I love about your book, your own little stories that are dispersed throughout it, but you share a story about you, um, speaking at a conference in your industry and you closed it by dancing or maybe yes. you opened it. Um, and how, like, and I'm just picturing a conference room with a bunch of suits, you're in like a kind of buttoned up industry and you go on stage and you dance. So like, it, did you have a moment where it was like, what the hell am I doing? And like this kind of shaking, I mean, this, th that's really bold. If, you know, if anyone who's listening has been to a conference and you know, like, you know what that room feels like and it's stiff yeah. and it's like a hushed quiet and it is not a fun party vibe where you're expecting uh, the company executive to get on stage and dance. So like, like talk a little bit about that and then what actually happened because you did that. Yeah, you know what's funny, and this is a good lesson for anyone that's listening. I, when I had the idea, no qualms. And then I ran into people telling me, "That's, uh, are you sure you want to do that?" Right? And so that you know, that's part of authenticity. Is inherently it feels like the right thing, but are you going to get side eyes, whether they're you know perceived or not? Yes. Yeah. So that that one was interesting. You know, it was it was actually a leadership conference. It was my whole team. So I was the CEO. So it was. Um, my team and we had we had consultants that we were working with and uh, we put together this amazing leadership event and you know they they were trying to make sure they were they were doing what everybody 
rightfully tries to do when they give you career advice or tell you, you know, how they've done it with success, they tried to make sure that I had a great opening and a great closing and I'm not a good planner. So it was good, you know, they really forced me to think about my opening speech before and then I, you know, I judged it and made it Aaron asked. But then it was the closing and they're like, look, you know, two and a half days, we've trained people across the country, we've culminated in this, like, what are you gonna do for it? And to serve me, they, they gave me an idea. So they sent this, this video and it's actually Derek Silvers who has a TED talk and he, he curated this, this video and it's, um, it's at, a comp, uh, at a concert and everybody's kind of just sitting there and then this guy stands up and he starts dancing. And then all of a sudden, you know, slowly everybody else around them dances. And, and the video has like um, words that go across that, that, you know, sort of the, you know, the metaphor. That one. Yep, yeah, yeah, it's very viral. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and it sort of sells this message about the, the lone nut and how, you know, they lead others. And so when I looked at it though, and this is, this is, you know, this is me. I just always sort of look at the authenticity and I'm like, so we're sitting in the room. It's, it, it, it's literally like five of us in a small little office. We're all sitting around. It's like two from the consulting firm, my like chief of staff, she was my chief of culture. Um, and then my conference head of the conference. Um, and they said, well, are you going to show the video? And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. The video. I love that video inspired me. I'm not, but I'm not, I'm not going to show the video. I'm just going to do what he does. I'm going to start dancing in 3D, right? I'm going to, I'm going to prove that same point. And then I'm going to get everybody else to dance. And Renee, they just looked at me. Like, I just remember people, them just like, everybody just sitting there kind of like mouths half open, like what? And, and, and they're like, uh, and I'm like, they're like, have you seen the video though? It has this great message. I said, okay, let's pull up the video again. So I pull up the video. And I remember literally, I was like, and, and I'm, I'm not a rude person, but I like stop it after like 10, 20 seconds. And I was like, this guy's not a leader. He's drunk. And the people aren't following him. They're drunk too. Like, <laughs> you know, I, it doesn't take much for me to be inspired to, to dance when I'm drunk either. Right. And, and I said, look, I, you know, but I love this idea. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to use this as inspiration. And I'm going to dance. And they just kept looking at me. And I finally said, look, okay, what's going on guys? Like, are you a worried about us having this amazing conference and then it all going to hell in a handbasket? Cause I dance or B, are you worried about me making ass of myself? And they're like, we're not worried about the first one. <laughs> and I said, perfect that I'm going to dance in. And, and here's the thing, you know, uh, there, the, uh, we'd been doing the conference. I knew who was sitting up front. I, for, I was like, first of all, this woman right here, well, I guarantee you she will be up in two seconds. She's just a super lively woman. And um, yeah, so I did it. And I would say it didn't take more than 15 seconds for the whole whole room to, you know, a hundred of my leaders to be dancing, which is wonderful. You see all the men that have no rhythm, you know, trying to like shimmy. And I went around and I did the running man with some of them and, <laughs> and we got done. I remember going over to the consultants and they were just like, wow, like we could not have ended it on a better note. And, you know, that's, you know, just always thinking about not just being different to be different, but thinking about like, don't go through an exercise in futility. If that's the message you want to do, go for it. And know that they're just have your best interest in mind because they're trying to teach you what everybody else has done. But like, that's not how we grow. That's not how we innovate. And so sometimes you gotta, you gotta buck the norm and do it. Even if they think you're kind of a weirdo. Uh, I mean, that that's like your life mantra, right? That should be everyone's <laughs> buck the norm and be the weirdo. Yeah, Tag, yeah. Tagline. It's actually just on a, on a at a clubhouse earlier today. My good friend Shelly Paxton, who you have to meet. I don't think you've met Shelly. She's a former CMO of of uh, Harley Davidson, and uh, now has her own brand, Soul Soulbatical. And she and I wrote it down. She literally goes because we were. I think we were talking about clubhouse. She goes, I don't want to know the rules. I want to break the rules. <laughs> like, typing it down. I'm like, oh, like instant quote. Uh, I love it. Uh, I mean, that's why we're friends. I feel like it, the, my whole like core group of people are a bunch of rule breakers. And it's fun. <laughs> exactly. It's the only way to be. So Erin, where do we find your book? How do we buy it? Yeah. So the book's out for, for pre-order right now. I'm not sure what it, on uh, February 15th, it will be released um, 
on Amazon. But the best thing to do is just go to my website, which is beauthenticinc.com, which is just the letter B and then authenticinc.com um, and go to the book page and you'll see all the information there. And then um, if you want to hang out with me more in 3D-ish land, I'm most active on LinkedIn at Aaron Hetzacostas and then on Instagram at Aaron Hetzacostas. And I'll put all that in the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. If you can spell it, you can find me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, final tip that you have for someone out there who says, I don't know where to start. How do you become authentic? What can someone do right now, right the second today? Yeah. 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 Know that do, doing authenticity is all about tiny little experiments. So, you know, some of the low, low barriers are things like your out of office message, you know, look at the thing that you've probably been saying the same damn BS for 20 years and talk like a human. Um, another quick hit is replacing, um, telling a story uh, at the beginning of a meeting, uh, when you're talking about trying to make a point that you normally would, you know, put a bunch of facts and figures, what metaphor, what story uh, can you use to replace it? Um, and then another really fun place to get the, the things going is your resume, your LinkedIn profile. Um, you know, if you want to check out mine, uh, it's a good place. If you look at all of my position summaries, including I'm on a board right now, and none of them are business buzzwords. It's all stories. I tell a story in every one of them. Um, and that's how you stand out. That's how you stand out from the crowd. So just do one thing different that quite frankly is what you'd want to see on the other side. And then just watch people's reactions. Be curious about, do they listen to you more in a meeting? Do they smile more? Do you maybe get noticed when you normally, you know, feel like you're sort of in the backdrop and then just, just keep doing those little experiments. Amazing. Thank you so much. I adore you. I adore your authenticity and your book is phenomenal. So everyone needs to grab a copy. Thank you so much for having me.